Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger. This is episode number 218, Dos Uno Ocho. How you guys doing? How you feeling? Hope you guys are well hydrated, well wrestled like Malaki. I'm feeling good. Uh, straight up coming at you from the home, home of the Olympics, somewhere in East London. If you know where it is, you know where it is. It's feeling like a good morning this morning. Um, I've not worked out this morning, the first time in a long time. Um, I took a bit of a break, but I'm going to go pound the gym or the pavement later on. Once I finish all my engagements, I have a very special gig happening later on this week today. That's why I decided, that's why I have taken the day off. That's why I have, I have, I have. That's why I've taken the day off from work. So in order for me to do what I need to do later on, I thought, you know what, what better way to get my creative juices flowing and to get that brain connectivity, connectivity going than by producing a little podcast and putting it out to you lovely, wonderful people. And before we get started, first things first, man, you know what I've realized, you know, when you start doing things that you don't like to do. You start to realize the things that you do like, right? That's the problem I tend to have with social media. We tend to people, you know, social media, there's a, there's a certain um, way of talking, a certain way of commentating on things that is a lot, wo- that is better, wo- that is wo- more well received on the internet than other things, right? There might be another app that might come along or there might be a more, a different emphasis on the algorithm to recognize people that praise stuff. But for the most part, the more snarky, catty and bitchy you are, the bigger you get, right? I only have to look at menswear commentators like Chris Black and all those kind of people, right? Um, they write some good articles here and there. Um, or, you know, don't get me wrong. They're great. They're great um, writers, great journalists in the kind of fashion, men's fashion realm. But for the most part, their most successful tweets have been like, you know, really snarky and kind of, you know, bitchy sort of like, you know, bro fashion commentary sort of stuff, right? And it serves them really well. I think for the most part, people live that kind of engagement. I'm not really a big fan of it, but... You know, I usually follow those guys for the links to articles that they link to because they, they're on the internet 24 hours a day, part of their job. So they're able to kind of like stumble upon things that I might miss, you know, seeing as I'm, I'm working and whatever, I might not have time to kind of browse Twitter and the Malarkey. So those guys are good aggregators of like cool articles that you can kind of read. But for the most part, their tweets are kind of, you know, on the mean side. They might say it's funny and whatever, but, you know, mean stuff. So um, you tend not to hear about praise, isn't it, right? Um, about stuff that you like but it's always kind of intrigued me that kind of thinking because i'm always a person that i don't know maybe it's the way i've grown up or maybe because of forum culture because you know on forums there wasn't really people never really spoke about things they didn't like on forums you, you could tell immediately what someone didn't like because of the number of pages they had on the actual topic right if it went from page one or i know the, the watchman scene is on please excuse the background noise but you know what can we do i record in my house it is what it is um if the forum topic had like a one next to it with a couple of dots and then loads of other numbers up um you know ascending numbers from like let's say 10 upwards you knew that was something you need to click on and kind of get in tune with right maybe it's had some news in there you need to be aware of <coughs> or some shoes that you probably might like but sometimes if something had only one page or didn't have any replies on it or whatever you knew i could just keep moving right keep it moving and not even concentrate on it so i think because of that education i tend not to be the guy to like bash things online or to say oh, i don't like this i just vote with my feet or i just vote with my lack of tweets or lack of attention because i think for the most part having been a creative or having still been still being a creative the times that bum me out the most when i'm making stuff is when i just get absolutely no reaction right you want some reaction even if people are hating it you want something <coughs> so when you get no reaction it's probably the best thing but some way we got into this point where on the internet um in order to be viral you have to be really mean um so in general people tend not to tell you what they like so it's quite have you never noticed how hard it is to find uh, out about new tv series on netflix or about new shows you'll be watching on showtime or hbo or amazon there's it's not a coincidence because most of the time people are complaining about stuff they don't like on those programs as a as on those platforms as opposed to talking about stuff they do like a rare example was the black madonna recently has been fucking banging on about euphoria i'm not sure if she's involved in it or if they kind of you know she got her involved in terms of being the artistic director or the, or the director of sound escape or whatever i'm not sure what involvement is or if anything but black the black madonna a very um well-known dj in the electronic music scene has been banging on about euphoria yeah for weeks now so much show that i've downloaded it right and i'm gonna watch it the next episode and um, hopefully by this weekend so that's a good way of like a good marquee of that right but i can't remember the last time where i've heard of a tv series from somebody on social media honestly i can't remember it 
I think the only times I've heard a TV series been mentioned in glowing terms has been maybe uh, via someone on the podcast like this, right? Where they talk about something they got up to the weekend, stuff they watched over Netflix over the weekend too. Because, you know, podcasts, long form. Um, there's no need to kind of sit here and just start hating for an hour. I think that model will get old quite quickly. There, there probably does exist a genre of podcasts that just talk about things they hate. I'm sure there's a podcast out there that's called Things I Hate Too. Um, but I don't know. I don't think this platform lends itself to that. It lends itself to like talking glowingly about something you're interested in, stuff that's intrigued you, stuff that's making you question the way you view things, blah, 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 blah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's just a strange world that we live in. And I think on, on top of that, while I was thinking about that, was you know this is a very anecdotal story but something you know and again something that might make me seem a little bit dumb but um i go and shop at my local shopping market uh shopping center here in the in east london where i live i'll i'll excuse the name but they have like a little hot deli stand right where they sell ready-made chickens and stuff and ready-made meats and sausages and whatever maybe so um usually because um i try and eat as healthy as i can during the week usually a kind of keto or primal based diet which includes a lot of greens a lot of meats <coughs> a lot of complex carbs blah 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 loads of water as i'm drinking here you know the standard stuff right so what, what i tend to do is i tend to buy the chicken ready made buy some salad in a bag put that in a box and then kind of carry on my day right sort of low maintenance um you know easy to make food i tend to buy this chicken in the morning because sometimes I, in the evening when i come back from work by the time i come back home it's 7 30 there's not much time to kind of go. There's not. There won't be much left at the counter when I go because you know the shopping center where I live is surrounded by loads of office buildings, loads of council buildings from people that work for the local borough and stuff. So most of those people, you know, kind of to save money or just in general because you know they don't necessarily tend to buy out from like um, regular restaurants all the time. We'll go into a supermarket and do as I do: buy some chicken, buy some lettuce, or buy some veggies, and then put that in a box. And Bob's your uncle, Granny's your aunt. You've got a nice lunch on your hands. So I tend to do that all the time. And I tend to do it in the morning after I finish my workout. When I go to the gym, it opens at 6. I finish at about 6.45, 6.50. Walk 10 minutes to the shop. It opens at 7. And then I'm able to go and buy it. But there's this one guy that works in this flipping shopping center, right? Who's really shit at his job, right? I think so, in my opinion. I'm not sure if this is true. I'm not sure if this is fact. But, you know, it's a podcast. Um, getting facts is boring. So, he's really shit at his job. Why? Because every time I go there and he's there, he always starts making the hot food when he gets in or when it's when the shop opens so what ends up happening is that you have to wait for half an hour for the food to be ready and that's not how, how it should be the food should be ready when the strip market opens they had they, had, they, don't, they don't have a separate sign on the deli window that says oh we will be having food ready from eight onwards it's a whole shopping mall it should be when you when it opens you should be able to buy anything you need it's a sup- supermarket yeah that's the general point of a supermarket but this dude Every single time that he's in, I flipping hate him working shifts because it's never on time. It's always bloody late. And then you get this, like, oh, how long is it going to be? Oh, 20 minutes, boss. 20, 20 minutes. That's like closing eyes thing. Like, don't close your eyes and talk. Just talk to me. Like, look at me eye to eye and tell me when my chicken's going to be ready. All right? I'm furious, man. I'm furious. I know it's fucking ridiculous. I know it makes you look like an absolute dummy, but I don't care. Right? Um, my time is super limited with work, right? Nine to five. It's limited as it is. I don't have enough time to, you know, come back home and get changed or come back home, drop my bag, go to the supermarket or go to the station, uh, go to the supermarket from the station, pick up my chicken because there won't be nothing left. There'll be dry bits and horrible burnt bits that no one wants left. There'll be nothing left there for me to buy, nothing. And we all know this, right? They've got limited resources. Of course, I can just go make my own chicken. I know, actually, you know, why you marry your own? But I don't want to do that. It's a waste of time. Waste of time. Time is our only non-renewables resource, right? I already waste enough time as it is on my phone, browsing social media. I'm now trying to combat that by reading bloody books and stuff, right? But I'm already losing a lot of time by doing that. So the only time I have available, I want to make use of it. And this guy's just disturbing my time. And today, this morning, guess what happened today? I woke up in the morning, woke up at 6.30, decided to get ready, head out, Listen to my audiobook for half an hour. Left thinking, okay, he should be ready by. Hopefully, he should be ready by now. No, sorry, I left at seven fifteen. Thinking, okay, last time I came, he said twenty minutes. So if I get that seven fifteen, maybe or at seven twenty, maybe he'll be ready by the time I get there. I get there. Guess what? Not one thing is cooked. Not one. Not one thing. The whole window, right? The whole little <coughs> window counter thing. No one section is full, and they've all each bit's got like those little silver trays that you can pop stuff in. No one of them is full. No one bloody annoying and you know what's annoying about it right because i've worked those kind of jobs before i had that job i was working at hollywood bowl which was a very popular um 
bowling alley place or bowling alley right uh bowling hall i don't know what they're called in east london near Bexham, right i'm not sure it's around anymore but i'm sure it's closed down but they used to have them all dotted around all over london um essentially all encompassing arcades bowling alleys hot food fried food um sandwiches coffees whatever you want all in there one area kids used to go there parents used to go there right next to the daughter's cinema so guaranteed chuck a block you know every weekend i worked there that was my first job yeah big up my uncle my uncle got me that job i was unable to get any other job on the high street i went to work at jd sports naturally because i'm a sneakerhead and stuff that didn't work out i went to work at fullerker but fullerker you remember when fullerker was so hard to get a job there they were so bougie man they used to go on like a fucking boutique which again in the beginning it made sense because they had some of the best man fullerker from the period of like 2002 2000 no 2001 2005 was insane the stuff they had in there man so good like track suits, the, the they had even had the hats to match them. They had amazing laces, great section of trainers. Like they were incredible Foot Locker man, so good. So they have a reason to be a bit bougie or act a bit stuck up. But um, Foot Locker was hard to get a job at. I don't think size is even in the equation. Osprey and Office didn't work out either. Just in general, really hard to get a job in any of those places. So luckily, my uncle um, was working as a janitor or like as a building manager for Hollywood Bowl. He was able to slip me in and got me a job right during working during the weekend. And um, it was kind of my no, it was my weekend job to begin with, and then it was my summer job. Man, that job fucking killed me <coughs> every day. So I started off right. I think they they did the same thing that loads of scummy companies did. They kind of brought me in under the premise that I'll be working with a team but then when i started working i was just working on my own so i was i was responsible for commanding the fried food section which is what they did with the chicken um chicken nuggets uh they did they had those um sauce they had those sandwiches that you stuff a, a, a baguette a baguette into it let's see if i can find it oh my god uh baguette sausage middle i don't know what they're called they're like these things that you cut the thing off the top right there you go found it so i was on the i was on a man right this is what i did there <coughs> crazy stuff so they had had us making chicken nuggets and chips standard you know what they look like and then they had us making these right so essentially what's it called it's called a frank's hot a french hot dog is that what it's called okay i didn't know it's a french hot dog so essentially um what well, we had baguettes though right so we had this um it's a baguette that you'd cut the ends off of so loads of wastage there and then you'd have this tall which was kind of similar to the uncork they used for uh, apple, um, but it had a more sharper ridges, and you basically stuff it in a bread and then pull it out and yank it. But yeah, there had to be a t technique behind it because sometimes I dig into it and pierce the through the baguette, and then all the ketchup would seep out of it once you're eating it. It gets messy, and obviously I want to do a good job because I'm a fucking good employee. When I get a job, I try and do my best that I can with it. Um, I tried to do it, it didn't work. So the, there had to be an exact science behind it. So the science I had behind it was to slightly toast it so the hard um, so the outside was really was a bit crispy and the inside would fluff up a bit and then you stick it in and pull it out toast it again and then and then make it but i don't do that for the girls i like when they can't pop if if a girl like popped in even though i had no particular chance of get hooking up with this girl or even getting a number because number one i was wearing this bright yellow polo top and i smelled like chicken nuggets i still that's it that's the kind of thing that i did right so essentially I'd, i started working there and the premise of being in a team, then it started transpired. I'll be on my own, and I had to essentially take the order at the stand, right? Oh, I want six chicken nuggets and two French hot dogs. Cool, take your money, give your change, run back to the flipping uh, kitchen and make the food. Back and forth, back and forth, right? And no one batted an eyelid. Thankfully, right? The parents were pretty understandable. I think they saw me, a young kid. 16 17 working there so they didn't they cut me some slack but no one it was like oh this is like against your human rights or whatever i'm sure it must have been right i'm sure it wasn't good for cleanliness either because i don't remember me wearing a, a gloves and i'm sure i sweat as much as i did back in the day i, I swear as, i sweat as much as i did then as i do now so i'm sure i was wiping my hand and stuff and really nasty stuff like loads of you know um what, what they called um regulations were being broken when i was working there but the main point of the story is that I did my job really well, right? I turned up on time. I made sure food was done. The first couple of weeks, I used to make it back and forth. Then I'd I'd, I'd kind of um, note down the busy periods and sort of make some food or some wings ahead of time or slightly make them and then refry it, like, half, like kind of half make them and then refresh your nuggets and make them again. The chips were kind of easy because they, they got done in five minutes. So I can make them fresh. 
And I always thought, you know, having fresh chips is more important than having fresh nuggets. I would think in my experience, right? There's nothing worse than putting a chip in your mouth that's been stale, been sitting on the side for ages. So I try and make them a similar standard, but if, whatever. I ended up quitting that job because it was getting a bit too shit and there's too much in, in, in the politics that made me work ridiculous hours. I was getting taxed a really high amount. Because imagine back then, the minimum wage is really low and the tax is what it is now. So you were getting, I don't know, after working maybe a whole week, maybe was it a week or... I think I was working like four weekends, I'd maybe get 200 quid, something like that, in my account, uh, clear, 200 quid, which is an insanely low amount, so I ended up quitting, but I did my job well, man, and this guy Morrison is just annoying me, because he's not doing his job well, he's turning up and just, you know, and just going through the motions, he's deciding that he won't cook before he gets there, cool, I get it, because it means you have to get there earlier, so he's trying to start his shift on, but I'm sorry, if you're working in a deli stand, you have to come in half an hour early, that's just the name of the game. It's just, it is what it is, right? <coughs> and I'm sure delivery guys do the same thing. There are certain roles you have to just come in a bit early for. So, yeah, that's my annoyance. Exactly. It's like people that work shitty jobs not doing a, not at least doing the the bare minimum. It's like turning up to Pret and it's not open on time because they, they didn't want to get, or they're not, they didn't prep the site. It's like, come on, it's not, it doesn't, it never happens. But anyway, what do I know, man? What do I know? Let's get back to the podcast. That's the most important thing. Me complaining about Morrison's chicken is a bit ridiculous, I know, but whatever. Anyway, and as you can tell, hay fever is still there. Um, I'm going to, I took some um, ginger shots, which the brunette kindly made this morning. I'm going to go to the GP later on, hopefully. Um, I can get an appointment before I leave from Manchester, and then I can uh, get that sorted too. Actually, let me blow my nose before I continue. Oh, mate. Allergy season. And I run outside every day as well, or every other day. So imagine how I must feel right now. Imagine. Yeah. So let's go. Let's do this. Um, <coughs> loads to talk about. Let's go. So, number one. Um, you know what? We should, let's go with this number one because I've, I haven't noted it down, but let's do this. Because I just saw this the other day and I thought it was very interesting. Mm-mm-mm. Let's get this up here. Boom. Okay, number one. So, uh, cover story with Kanye West on Forbes. Um, as a lot of you have probably seen over the last few months, or if you've noticed, or if you haven't, I'll explain to you, or other people have kind of felt. I've kind of gone off a bit of Kanye, right? Especially Kanye commentating on things or speaking, I think. As well, it's not anything to do with him. <coughs> I just think the older I've become, the more I've started to read books, the more exposed I've been to people in the intellectual dark web, the more I've been listening to people like Joe Rogan, the more I've been just, again, just being curious, intellectually curious and kind of seeking other forms of inspiration, motivation, information, whatever it may be, I've tended to kind of pull away or to not take as much value as I did in the past to popular pop figures speaking on social issues or economic issues or politics, whatever it may be. I just don't take it as seriously or I don't pay as much attention. And in the past or in the last few years, I'm sure people um, can attest to this who are frequent members of the Kanye to the um, forum, they will know that... Um, People they're obsessed with Kanye, obviously, because it's a Kanye-based forum. They will be keenly aware that in the beginning, like we used to dissect and you know memorize or um, really read into every single stream of consciousness Kanye decided to have. Right, his rants also known as stream of consciousness. We were looking forward to him. Right, we couldn't wait for his next tour stop uh, during any tour that he did, and you know want to hear want to hear get someone um, hoping someone recorded his rant. That went on for 10 minutes. We spoke about everything from, you know, label situations, family, friends, whatever, business. It was quite interesting to get an insight into his mindset. Because, you know, aside from Kanye, or maybe, I don't sure if Kanye was maybe the first. But there weren't many celebrities of his level. People that were performing on that high of a stage that were so um, prone to speaking publicly about the most intimate details going on in their personal life, right? They really kind of blew the door open in terms of understanding the business and how it works and how they deal with it emotionally. And again, we're very grateful for it. But again, as you get older and you start to become a little bit more intentionally curious, you start to gain more life experiences. Kanye's um, rants don't tend to wait, wait, um, hit you as hard, right? Or they don't tend to kind of reverberate or, um, you know, to you as well as they do maybe in the past. 
And then couple that with his kind of, you know, disastrous timing in terms of his political um, affiliations or the fact that he's now infatuated with Trump and called him, you know, the most important man in his life and he didn't have a father and he's a father figure to him. Loads of really weird trolley shit. <coughs> Besides all that, he just came at the worst possible time. So if ever there was a good time to kind of mute Kanye and kind of just like mute him out of your mind so he didn't follow him, it was now was the time, right? Because he was, he kind of went on the political deep end. He didn't really talk, you know, he didn't really... Um, speak with any kind of clarity he didn't really have all the information to hand he was relying on his feelings and not facts which is you know on politics it's not very um a, it's not the most rational thing to do it doesn't necessarily lead to the right outcome it doesn't necessarily lead to any nuanced point of views or idea it just leads to more tribalism and parroting of what the other people on the other side are saying even though he's trying to operate a middle ground and trying to be like hey you're demonizing people on the right people on the left you know you need to make you to make you to surround everyone with love essentially still rabbit he's still kind of speaking in the same sort of political speech that everyone else is speaking about and Jay's just not educated about what he's more educated about so it is what it is who cares but nothing no one can deny that when kanye starts speaking about design starts to speak about art starts to speak about culture starts to speak about streetwear starts speaking about stuff to do with this business there's no one better than that <laughs> and i think this forbes article uh, covering the fact that Kanye's Yeezy brand has now been valued at a billion dollars really does a good job of highlighting just how special of a human being he is when it comes to that side of things. And I think, as per usual, this debate is always kind of going to boil down to can you separate the artist from the art? And I think you can because his, his level of art is at such a high level compared to, you know, he's essentially a white belt when it comes to anything to do with socioeconomical issues, right? He doesn't have the slightest clue. Uh, but when it comes to... Uh, art and culture and how that influences our politics in general because he could easily do that that way right you know it's like it's like param it's like an equivalent to setting up a football pitch in a very divided neighborhood that also invites people from other countries to take part in a global tournament right imagine the neighborhood that predominantly voted for brexit and then you decide to um open up a cage a football cage where um you invited different um low-income neighborhood kids to come and play there they get experience of playing against an English side, improve the English, and English kids would get experience of kids <coughs> who are the same age as them, but from completely different worlds, right? Um, and again, it'll be a way to kind of bridge the gap. The parents can make friends with the parents. You know, it's a good way. So that's a that's a way where design, architecture, all that sort of stuff, um, planning could kind of uh, seep its way into, into politics. But for him to kind of sit down and get educated on policies and all that sort of stuff, I don't think that's possible. Same way it's not possible for somebody to sit down and decide they want to make my beautiful doctor's dependency in the in their bedroom, right? It's not going to happen. There's different levels of, of craft here. But Kanye talking to Forbes was fucking brilliant. I'll play bits of, bits of the clip now and then we can kind of speak about the things he spoke about. Hold on, let me input the volume up here. This is really nice. I really like what you're saying about design there. Uh, let's see if I can get something up there. Ba, ba, ba. Let's move, improve the sound a little bit because it's a bit low, isn't it? Hmm. Okay, there's a lot higher now. Let's go again. Second time around. <coughs> I like that. I'm really, I really like that idea. Um, again, it comes from a very original place. It probably goes against everything that Virgil does at the moment, right? He's very, ref he's very self-referential or referential of the scene in general, right? He always says that he's not here to make original ideas. He's here to reinterpret works that's already done and kind of apply his three three percent design rule. But I like the idea that, again, both operate in the same field but come from different point of views, which is the beauty of design, the beauty of culture in general, right? you got two very high-performing people who are able to um, put out their art from different points of view, and it's perfectly fine. No one's better than the other. Everyone's got their way of doing things. But you can also see just how much um, work goes into 
referencing the past or when it comes to Kanye's work. Just look at his studio, right? Look at where they're sitting. They're sitting on these amazing chairs that look like they've been, I don't know, designed in the 1970s, maybe 60s, maybe even before that, taking reference from maybe stuff that's happened in the, in the 50s or the 40s or even the 1800s. Look at the chair, look at the table, however that is, this, the bookcase, the carpet rug, the lamps, the, the flower plot. You can just see from his environment that what he's referencing hundreds of years back is something that is actually living day to day. And again, I just wish that, especially nowadays, I think there's been a big conversation. I think I've, I've spoken about it myself in terms of the fact that how I'm pulling away from social media. I'm not really posting that much on there. Only when I've got work done and I'm ready to pull it out to the world, which again puts pressure on you to kind of get work done. I'm not posting in progress stuff because that's again, in progress pictures is similar to when, you know, remember I told you a story about um, athletes going to, or runners, if he's a runner's, um, not turning up to London Marathon, right? London Marathon's always oversubscribed and people don't turn up to the actual race uh, because they feel as if like just signing up and getting the pre-presentation, pre-approval email is already part of, you've already won, right? Because you've got all the lights, you've got your dopamine hits, uh, your serotonin has been satisfied. And I think in progress design images are the same, right? Sketches or PDA, PSDs. I'm not really a big fan of them. I think they, they just kind of take away from actually making the item. You can spend a lot of time aligning a, a graphic on a t-shirt on Photoshop, but then, you know, making it, screen printing it, getting it digitally printed is a whole different game. And I'm sure other creatives out there know that. So it's great to see um, that conversation happening. But I'm hoping now, instead of just people putting it from social media, they use it as a tool, man, to display your artwork, right? Instead of kind of, or display the wares that you're selling and market yourself. But instead of just kind of posting, um, I don't know, in development things, it's not really necessarily the best way to go about things, I would say. <laughs> tell the my apparel team that the clothes that we're using like single material i remember sending it's it's funny right that he says that and he completely ignores the first bit of that bible scripture <laughs> but it's the same with all, all christianity i guess in terms of uh, again i'm happy that he's got a faith and he's got a religion in place i think that's something that the world in general probably needs more of right a spiritual practice i think now we've succumbed too much to the digital algorithm where you know heavily um sedated <coughs> where numb to compassion um you only have to see what's happened to asap rocky and the whole sweden thing right there's people out there actually gloating that he's been arrested and that now he might become a political activist because now he's been you know he's been kind of racially profiled and before in the past he was very hesitant to get involved in politics which is not a bad thing right it's okay to be a celebrity of his of or rocky's ilk and say you don't want to get involved in politics because this might not be a strong suit he's asap rocky he's paid to look handsome uh, to look good in clothes, to rap really well, and to make good beats, right? He's not and to model. He's not paid to talk about political issues. That's really not one. But people are gloating now that he's been arrested and he's in solitary confinement because he hasn't been uh, forthright in his opinion about black about politics surrounding police brutality. Don't get me wrong. I thought some of the comments he said on Breakfast Club were cringe. I thought the thing he said on stage was cringe regarding the Ferguson riots and stuff. But I don't know, man. What what do I expect from Asa Rocky? Um, when it comes to political issues not much he hasn't really given me much to expect from him anyway it's not a bad thing to say but when it comes to design when it comes to taste level when it comes to shopping when it comes to um how to attract women when it comes to building um i don't know a record label a production agency a design agency festival stages yeah you listen to him but other things why not like but it's just funny that kind of would quote that and then not reference the first bit about you know funny but hey that's why the Bible's messed up. So what? You know that's have interracial marriages in the Bible. Nuts, isn't it? Um, a manager I used to work with, a really rude email about how every time he wore this wool jacket with leather sleeves, he said, coach your back by ten. <laughs> so now I can send him the verse. Do you remember that Philip Flynn jacket? Did he wear that too? Kanye can't really talk. Do you remember he did he wore that in the past? Did Kanye make that, that that jacket famous? That leather jacket with the weird sleeves. Do you remember? I think it was two thousand nine. There was that leather jacket. Was it Philip Flynn? I swear it was Philip Flynn. I swear it was. Man, that doesn't matter. I'm not kind of trying to prove that Kanye is wrong. This is ridiculous. Let's carry on with the video. Verse from the Bible <laughs> that says. You should not wear a garment of cloth made of two kinds of material. Look at that. And again, this is probably the best bit of it. This He made an entire will of all the shoes that Kanye has designed. 
and it's all been color gradient sort of like design where i'm sure they have to do some photoshop prime first or maybe they did it in real life first but that looks incredible so it's all been put into an amazing let's, let's just call it a spectrum right or there's there is a harmonic wheel that i use for djing where you can kind of use different uh, keys in order to kind of blend music so it sounds effortless but this is amazing it's sort of like a, a design wheel you've got everything from unreleased basketball runners to 700s to sandals like just incredible 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 design shoes there really, <coughs> really well done <coughs> yeah just incredible 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 <coughs> Uh, Forbes estimate West's pre-tax income 150 million over the past um, year, mostly due to his um, Yeezy empire. <clears throat> Look at that. It's incredible how good that one looks. Wow. Tell me a little bit about the creative process where you design them. Just start with a sketch. Start with a vintage reference. Wow. They could start with a previous shoe that we created that we're making a new version of wow look at, look, at, look at all the shoes man i want to i want to take my time and scan over some of these flipping diamonds in there there's some absolute gold in there look at these there's those basketball shoes that haven't i, I think they mentioned in the article that nba shoes well in the nba have to be approved by the nba they have to go through a rig, rigorous amount of testing before they're approved i don't think Yeezy's shoes have been approved just yet but that will show just the power of kanye if he's able to kind of infiltrate yeezy that means sponsorship. That means representing athletes. That would be incredible if that happens. That would be so cool. Um, yeah, seen loads of different prototypes and different kind. The first 700s are one of my favorite shoes ever done. Uh, you got the, I don't know, what, what, what are they? Are they 800s? I forgot the name of those. Those kind of moon runner type shoes. Oh, it looks so good. It's, it's got 20 cents. They could start with a previous shoe that we created that we're making a new version of. You know, feelings of films wow. and experiences that I grew up with. Wow. What, what are those? Oh, look. He's got like a sort of soccer runner. Okay. It's a power ball, whatever it's called. Power phase. Done in different materials. There's a boot here with sort of like a sock strap. There's, again, those duck waffle boots I'm a big fan of. Hopefully, they come back again in the winter. We'll see more of those. Wow. Akira. The movie Akira. My mom took me to see Akira when I was really young. And the color wow look and at those boots mama mia there's nothing like a bit of gray with neon laces right is there that's why the wave runners are such a cool shoe there's nothing better than that but i think those weird cloud ones at the back here i don't know what those are but whatever that is here those are the ones i can't wait to come out they're sort of like a cloud sock sort of like shape color they look insane like nothing on the market <laughs> shows my dad you know the first time i saw a, a white lamborghini Countach in real life and i remember the guy said i couldn't even touch the car and i was obsessed with his car as a child like, you know. is there any shoe that that Countach is uh you know kind of represented it there's a little bit of lamborghini in everything i do okay okay <laughs> so easy so is the lamborghini of shoes <laughs> You, the idea comes to you, you wow. sketch it out, and then what? We have a team it. of uh, incredible. We'll take the entire design team to Japan. We'll take so the cool. design team to zone and, and talk about you know where we would like to take these ideas. And I mean, it's a painting. It's a, it's a, it's a spirit the, that's in inside of it. That's now. You know what I would also like kind of to explain? Um, he's designed his fashion choices of late. It's no coincidence that since he's been able... <coughs> and I think it's something I remember Rick Owens talking about quite often, right? Um, the whole video is really cool. I recommend you check it out. Um, loads of really cool snippets about him talking and stuff. I'll, forward it. I'll fast forward it in a minute, but quickly speak about this. There was a video... I remember Rick Owens speaking about this often, and I think Steve Jobs also eschewed the same sort of philosophy. Designing at a really high level... Especially when you're not an entertainer or in a, any more in that conventional sense, right? He might be an artist where he provides music and stuff, but he's not like shucking and jiving or performing every weekend for his money or even for his artistry. And if you're just committing yourself to another form of art, then needs to, you, need to const, you need to have all your facets available to do that. You need to give all, your, all of yourself to it, right? None, none of your energy can be spent on anything else but that. 
right? So there are a lot of artists out there, especially if you read the book by Mason Curry, which is called um, Rituals or something. I've got the name. I've got it somewhere around here, but there's a book called Rituals that I might have. I can't remember where it was. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'll find another time. But it's a book called Rituals where he basically, Mason Curry basically unpacks the, you know, the, the timetables or the working schedules of loads of really influential people in culture. And what he discovered was that a lot of them have like really stringent ways of how they work, right? Nine to five, four to six, eight to nine, whatever. They have a way of working timetable. <coughs> but when they unwind, they unwind completely. It's nothing to do with creative. So he might, I, feel, I think I've heard Kanye mention a few times that he was a big fan of Empire. He watches that with his wife. He watches loads of trash TV with his wife, right? And if you read our other interviews with other creatives, they have, that, they have that tendency too, right? To watch like catfish and that sort of stuff and i've always wondered why and i think the reason is because when you're creating at that high level you can't use any of your creativity apart anywhere else outside of the thing that you're creating outside of your field or fields of expertise so when you're relaxing there is no time to do anything else but to relax to completely turn your brain off from creativity of where it is because those shows especially those reality tv shows are so well produced they're so well done they have that 40 minute half an hour template so amazingly crafted it, that it doesn't require any of your mental uh acumen or intellect or capacity to kind of understand what's going on there you can just sit back relax and get entertained right it's just an easy stream of, of of shows going through your brain especially if you've got a netflix especially if you've got amazon prime you just keep stuff just going on loop on loop on loop on loop on loop on loop and i think a, a lot of that also reflects on kanye's fashion choices for himself he tends to dress in very neutral colors not a lot of branding or logos tend to wear his like staple design pieces from dickies or carhartt just a very plain wear of wearing clothes whereas it pre previously yesteryears when he wasn't creating at such a high level or maybe he wasn't being able to create such a high level he tend to wear a lot of stuff you might saw on the runway loads of trendy jeans trendy jackets the newest shoes but nowadays he's completely reverted back to essentially looking like a workman right and i think rick owens is the same sort of thing he tends to wear the same outfit again and again right the cut sleeve shirt the the pod shorts the geo baskets or whatever other shoe that he put out during that time and that's it same apparel again and look at the difference between how rick owens wear how rick owen dresses and michelle lamy dresses and look at the difference of how kanye wet dresses and kim Kardashian dresses the women in relationship dress fan blowingly right they get ready michelle lamy puts on her nails she does the little dip on her fingers the the rings the thing on the head like there's a lot of work that goes to michelle lamy's look whereas kim is the same sort of thing but the men very very much uniform and I think it's because they're performing at such a high level, they can't afford to be wasting time getting dressed, right? You can't look like ASAP Rocky and create the easy brand. I don't think it's possible. You have to choose one or the other. I think so, personally, I think so. Because there's a skill too, to being really good at shopping, to knowing how what good, looks good on your body, to spotting new brands, to traveling the world, to go and buy a, this piece of clothing because it's only available in this store, this set amount of time. There's a talent in that too, but that can't be transported to making. I don't think so. I think those two things are quite separate. Consumer is different. I'm saying like dressing at a high level, like looking amazing in clothes all the time. That's different to like, you know, shopping and just being a consumer. Anyone can do that. Passive shopping is simple. But being a <coughs> an actual style icon and also designing, not easy things to do. Maybe Haida Aikerman is someone that's similar. He dresses quite different every day. And I don't know. But I don't think that's possible in my opinion. Let's continue. Translate it into these miniature vehicles. The yeah, Jordan line does approximately uh, $3 billion in annual sales. West line is expected to top $1.3 in 2019. And that's, be, and that's also noting that Kanye West Easy line hasn't been around, maybe, not has not even been around for a decade, has it? Has it been five years yet since Easy launched? Maybe it's been five years? That's insane, the amount of growth that they've done. Whoops. Went too far back there. Just soaking in all the shoes. Amazing. I, uh, like, yeah, those those ones there, whatever those cloud things are at the bottom, they're the ones I look in. They're the ones that I'm, they're the special ones. They're the ones I, I feel I'm gonna change the game. They look fucking insane, like literally insane. It's like molten lava all over the trainer. That's the kind of thing that you would expect. This, the, you know, when they were making, you know, the Jetsons and stuff. Like, you know, they envisaged this this day in Earth where we'd be flying around in flying cars and living in skyscrapers, suspended in space and shit. This is what we expected our shoes to look like, not Air Max Ones again or Air Jordans again. Do you know what I mean? Like, we expected futuristic looking shoes, and these look like the future. Look at all these. Look at these designs. Look at these ideas. Like, 
this all together. The protos, the, the, the versions that you've seen in actuality and the versions that never quite made it to be able to see inside of this. There's, wow. you know, this is an infinite amount of works in front of you. There's so many prototypes that go into what you eventually get. How many prototypes do you think per shoot you'll cycle through before you get to build the US? It's hundreds. We work on, we like I said, miniature vehicles. We work on shoes like someone would work on a car. Let's say we're looking at 2,000 shoes. <laughs> Look, I'm angry. I love Kanye. It's like, we, like, you already told he's agitated because the answer to him sounds so preposterous. Like, it's not about numbers, it's about feeling. Who cares about the numbers, right? Because in Kanye's head, he was a guy that famously said he spent, what, 500 hours making My Beautiful Dark Twitch Fantasy, you right? So, or whatever it was, or I forgot the track, what he made or something. Anyway, there, there was a famous anecdote he said about how, how he basically was crafting it like a, a, a piece of art, right? Fine-tuning every single instrument, every single hi-hat. So for someone to stand there like a journalist, right? Pretty square-looking journalist to be like, oh, but how many exactly? It's because you can quantify, right? Because they, they come from the world of quantification, right? <coughs> it's as if like... <clears throat> They come from the world where if they found that Leonardo DiCaprio painted a hundred times in order before he got to whatever he got to, right, they'd do the same thing. Leonardo DiCaprio, Leonardo da Vinci. If they found Leonardo da Vinci, right, worked on a sketch one hundred times before he went to a masterpiece, they would then quantify that in order to become the next Leonardo da Vinci, you have to make a hundred uh, you have to sketch a hundred times a day. That's not the point of it. The point of it is the feeling, is the intuition, is the momentum that you get from sketching a hundred times. It doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna uh, create a masterpiece at the end. Numbers don't really matter. It's not, not about the amount of time. It's about the joy that comes from being able to design. Imagine Kanye's got full ownership of his own brand that he now co does he co produce it under ADS or is it done in the house? I'm not too sure, but 400% ownership of his own brand. He's finally being able, the thing that he was screaming and crying about, more so than re re the record label thing, we didn't really get a chance to see it because, again, I wasn't very in tune with Kanye um, during the whole graduation time. I kind of jumped on maybe during 808s and Heartbreak. So, we did. I didn't really get that whole uh, label thing and him being a producer and fighting for, to be a rapper. But we got to see how much he was invested in becoming a fashion designer, in becoming somebody that could create at a high level, somebody that can contribute to design, to art, to interior design, to architecture. He's finally been able to do it now. So for someone to stand there and tell him, "Hey, um, how many designers take you to get to, to get to this place?" It doesn't matter about the designs. I can do it. I'm able to do it. That's what I care about, which is always the best thing. I love him. Yeah, so it does, when someone says they love sneakers, they criminal. You know, there's um, there's a lot of uh, gamers, especially like the, the quarter ring. A lot of people that play games who are always kind of talking about, you know, some of the nonsense that gets spewed in kind of, you know, um, games journalism, right? Ever since Gamergate, there's been this whole breed of social justice gamers that have come out who have been fighting a fight for more inclusivity in games and less um, degradation of women in games, which is fine, but sometimes they go on a bit too much and they talk some bullshit. And usually whenever they start an article, it's always like, you know, I'm a gamer or I've, I've loved this game since the 90s. It's always some stupid anecdote. That's not, that's not true, right? That's obviously just a way of them trying to self-validate themselves into a culture. And I think this guy's the same. You say you love trainers, it's not, you know, the last thing I'd be asking Kanye when I'm here on behalf of Forbes, if I'm a sneakerhead, is also, uh, uh, imagine you're a correspondent for Forbes that specializes in streetwear, terms, you know, in terms of kind of getting behind the numbers of streetwear, and I'm a sneaker fan. I won't be geeking out about the numbers about production wise. I'll be geeking out about just the processes and the paneling and the detail that goes into some stuff and the references and all that. That's the what I'll be panning the tooling of the shoe. Not the fucking amount of prototypes and how many sketches I got. Who gives a shit? Those things are beautiful. When you when you collect Jordan ones or you collect Air Max 90, he's not creating them because you want to own every single one. Because every single one is beautiful to you. Every every released Air Max 90 from the one that released originally in the 90s, the one that's released in 2001, has a different level of detail and attention to it that <coughs> or reminds you of a different 
place and time that you were. Who cares about when they were made? Come on. Or how many were made? surprise cake from your grandmother and you didn't know she was in town do you start asking her about the batter (laughs) 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 but that's what people need to realize about artists and people who dedicate their life and go to the hospital and back to bring joy that they should be loved Joy. Uncalculable yeah. joy. I agree, man. Because my wave runners bring me a lot of joy, whether they are somewhere around here. They bring me a lot of joy. Where are they? Uh, there they are. These things bring me a lot of joy. All right, Kanye? I get a lot of joy from these, mate. A lot of joy. A lot, a lot of joy. A lot of joy I get from this. Thank you so much, Kanye, for your time, for these shoes. I love you. I love you. Anyway, um, let's continue again. Kanye West still owns 100% of Yeezy. This is the reason he became a center millionaire many times over earning his life than Michael Jackson. Amazing. This is going to be the new trend now going forward, which I'm happy about. Ownership, right? If people are going to own the stuff that they make, which is a very weird thing to say out loud because it sounds like it should be the norm, but it's not. People don't own things anymore. They always license things out. Punch. And I guess it has a lot to do with people not being patient really right not wanting to do the long road right everyone wanted to kind of get the check immediately like signing and getting the cash advance so you can cash out that's what they want the money for but in the end ownership is going to be the name of the game and licensing is going to be something you might do or production deals or something but self-ownership has to be the name of the game you can't have a brand it's such a shame and a misery to hear somebody who created a brand based on their name and then suddenly they get a point where they're not able to design things on their own name under their own name anymore they get booted out of their own company that's not the way to go i'm not i'm not really for that sort of stuff so hopefully we see this new trend of a lot of independence in culture in general because you know these shoes are impacting everyone like yeezys are probably the most popular shoe out there right you you see you see so many people wearing yeezys are probably uh, yeah they're up there with nike Adidas. they have to be because they cover such a wide range of people you see everyone from hipsters to streetwear people to older people to mums and dads to kids wearing them it's all over the place it's amazing Amazing. All of these shoes are inside of every single shoe. It all flows, everything flows into everything. And this is how connected we are as, as human beings. All of them have a spirit. They're all of the family. There's not one bad shoe. Any of these shoes that even didn't make it 20 years from now, you'll look up and that shoe would be, you know, worth to the numbers guys you know, <laughs> you know, what's a what you know what's a Picasso sketch work a Warhol sketch look from this put yourself in the center just walk right here you can step on some of these come to the middle don't worry about stepping on them I know the maker <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing How do you feel? Amazing. Look at it, it's so beautiful, man. <laughs> but yeah, big up Kanye. He looks like he's in a much better place now. Um, hopefully, we see more of this and less of the Kanye political speak because I'm just not bothered about it. But even if he does want to talk about politics, it's all well and true. I'm just not going to pay attention to it. But I can't separate the art and the artist. 
Because I'm a grown up, all right? I'm a grown up. I don't need my artist to say, to grab it, all my own political ideals or to represent my ideas in 100%. That's why I like them because they can do, they can basically interpret what I'm feeling through music and also challenge what I'm feeling. That's why I like my artist. Anyway, moving on. I've been reading this. The Man Who Quit Money by Mark Sundin, an amazing book that profiles one Daniel Swello who in 2000 decided to give away his life savings and begin to live a life of no money, right? He he bartered for, he basically was able to um, uh, offer his services to work in soup kitchens or cafes for free in exchange for meals or lodging. He was able to uh, lodge with other people just in terms of living off the land freely. Loads of challenges that came from it. A really interesting book regardless, but <coughs> the interesting thing for me is that this book made me question my preconceived notions of homelessness in general, right? And what that actually meant. Because in Stratford, we have a very um, big problem with homelessness. I think anyone that's walked through Stratford Shopping Mall will know that essentially been turned into like a homeless village. People live in there basically every hour of the day, if not most of the time that is closed from, I think, 7 p.m. onwards. People are camping out and getting their sleeping bags and sleeping there all night because it's warm and because it's under 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 a roof or whatever it may be so you know it's quite distressing seeing it but i'm not gonna lie and say that sometimes i've walked through there especially when you walk through there and you see young guys who are the same age as you or who look physically capable and don't look like they have any clear and obvious physical disabilities and you do question you think you know what are you doing enough to really rescue yourself in this position because i remember there was a time when um jordan peter said something really quite interesting where he said um we have representations of hell amongst us right hell isn't just this hell isn't the literal term of hell where it's underground and it's fiery flames and shit hell is what we see in the world around us that makes us shudder and it makes us see ourselves in it so much so that we don't want anything to do with it right and he references homeless people he said the reason why we walk through the reason why the reason why we can't look at a homeless person when we're walking to work or when we're in our major metropolitan cities is because that person represents us right they they are a living embodiment of hell they represent what we could end up being because i don't think anyone in their right mind has walked past a homeless person and been like that could never be me right you've never said that what you've said is like why can't they do what i do right as opposed to you know somehow you're giving yourself credit for getting yourself where you are right as if like it's all to do with you when it isn't right you're lucky that you are even born um, you're lucky that you're born into a family you're born into, the time you're born into, um, the fact that your parents might have had means or money to move you to a place where you could go to a good school, the fact that you can go to school in the first place. There's loads of things that have happened in your life outside of you maybe having drive and you know go to go get attitude that are really more to, that have really have a lot more to do with why you're successful as opposed to what you think. Right, a lot of people especially people with a, a massive ego would think that they got to where they got to just because of their sweat and their balls and their hard work it's not it's part of the makeup but a lot of it is luck right you just were born at a lucky time you got the you, got, you won the g lottery and now you are where you are so i think that quote from jordan peterson really hit home to me because it made me think yeah that's the reason why i can't look home with people because they brand me of hell and also it just enrages me sometimes when they're younger people and they're homeless because i think why can't you just live the way i'm living but then you read this book and this guy essentially is homeless essentially has is living he's, he's basically humbling himself to humanity and saying that i need help i need assistance i'm hoping that the world can help me and in, and in, in return i can help the world by not taking much away from it right he's not his carbon footprint is fairly minimal um he's not wasting electricity he's not polluting right he's essentially just living off what's around him right feeding off scraps feeding off leftovers which is plenty of and he's giving back a lot he's bringing joy he's uh, making me question my point of view and again just made me question just sometimes you know, your preconceived notions where you think the person that's homeless is trapped but maybe they're free maybe they are actually free maybe they've actually discovered the truth and the meaning of life right maybe they decided that instead of kind of going through this continual rabbit race or this you know this hamster wheel of working working just to keep keep the lights on just again working working especially when you're working a shitty job with shit pay you're just continually working it's taking up every minute of your waking hours of your life that you're not getting anything away from it it's just a continual slog and slog and slog until eventually you reach this zen point but what this book really made me question or made was really interesting right this has been the first book the first book maybe outside of maybe the four hour work week the four hour work week i think maybe 
the title has a lot to do with it. But it's the first book that's really, 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 really encouraged a weird reaction from people outside in public. Whenever I read this book, people have a very visceral reaction about, oh, he can't do that. Surely no one could quit money. People are very quick to poo-poo it. And again, what made me think is that when you're living a life that's uncommon to others or when you have uncommon standards or when you're doing things at an uncommon level, people just don't get it, right? I work out sometimes twice a day. I run from home sometimes from work. I work out an hour before the, I go to work. I record the podcast two hours before I get to work. I read a book, four books a month. There are things that I do that people get really bent out of shape about because I guess for some reason, because I'm doing it, it somehow makes them feel inferior, which I don't know why. That's a really stupid way to look at things. But they really get a, away from it. How can you? That's impossible. You can't do that. And it's like, no, I can. I'm doing it. I'm, I'm, I'm evidence that you can do it. You just have to decide that you want to do it. And I do it every single day. And I think this book really represents just how um, trapped we are in what we are doing at the moment where we're not able to question anything. You only have to look at the people on the financial independence um, subreddit, a really cool subreddit where people talk about or exude about the fact that they're financially independent, which requires you to effectively spec out a saving uh, plan, whether it's 75%, I think is the minimum, they ask you to save 75% of your salary, which for some people is like mind-blowing because it means you can't buy anything again. Or if you do buy something, you have to sell something. So you save 75% of your salary for a, a perspective amount of time. Let's say it's seven years. Let's say it's 10 years, right? And the plan is after 10 years, you'll have built up enough savings that after 10 years, you can live off the amount that you saved, 75% for like another 10 years. But in order to kind of sustain that for the rest of your life, you take the savings, a portion of your savings, and you invest it into investments into bonds into whatever you know you get into a stock market which means you'll be accruing an income over time but then what it, what i've realized is that that practice of saving that amount of money for 10 years is going to severely diminish the way that you spend money to the point of where you won't spend as much as you did in the past and what you end up happening you end up being able to have loads of more free time you know working nine to five you can pursue all your passion projects and hobbies that you have outside of work and this is a very weird and uncommon thing to hear from people because everyone's like, oh my God, that's impossible. You can't do that because their vision of retirement is getting to 60 and then deciding finally to buy a motorbike and, you know, and ride it across China, as they mentioned in the four hour work week. But retirement isn't that. Retirement is being able to sustain yourself for the rest of your life whenever that moment comes. If it comes when you're 35, if you're 40, 26, 18, it doesn't matter. But retirement isn't this far off stretch goal. It's something you can do right now. But what happens, you have to kind of Cut down on your Friday work drinks, cut down on the amount of stuff that you buy from shops, cut down on the amount of holidays you take so that you can have your time on the earth be valuable and not be wasted um, spending time at work. Just, you know, go through that rat race. I, you know, I've only just been I've only just been introduced back into the regular, regular nine to five um, working schedule again recently. And it's been it's been a lot getting out of Liverpool Street Station and just seeing the hordes of people rushing off to work no real attention being paid to who's around them no appreciation of the fact that they're alive and that they can breathe the air and stuff just everyone just head down heading to work to trudge out another eight hours of meaningless right most people do have jobs that are meaningful but for the most part we're just you know, spinning the wheel so if we're able to somehow supplement our wage by doing a hobby that we work on the side that makes life more meaningful i know for me doing this podcast recording a podcast putting it out recording dj mixes going to dj in bars and pubs even though you're paying you fucking meaningful me, uh, measly amount these are things that are making my life more meaningful and they're allowing me to kind of curtail any kind of misery i might feel working at nine to five but honestly this book man it's been incredible it's been a one book that's really gotten a lot of reaction again it showed me just how stuck in our way some humans are whereas you know i came into this book with have with loads of preconceived ideas right about homelessness and it's made me challenge it's challenged all my ideas changed some of my ideas but some people just by looking at the title are like, no, surely he can't do that. He can't live without money. Yes, he can. He's done it. There's a guy right there. That's him. And this guy, Mark Sunday, written about it. It's here, right? It's right there. Someone has done it. It's not impossible. You can do it. It's just like, but that way of saying things is just like so out of blue for some people. Like, what? It's impossible. It's like, no, it isn't. Somebody's done it. He's right there. That guy's did it. He did it. And I've always been of, of the ilk. That's why I probably don't um, celebrate um, you know, middle middle managers as much as pe other people do or, you know, gatekeepers because I've always looked at the like, so, you know, if James J.B. did it, if Nigo did it, if Ochi Fujiwara did it, why can't I do something of that level too? Does that have to be the same thing? Does it be in the same area? But if they did it, they are proof that you can do it and James J.B. is an even worse example because he doesn't even skate, mate. 
and you created one of the most, if not the most meaningful skateboard brands in the world, right? He has, I don't know, he can walk into any skate shop in the world and have, you know, have the fucking whole staff shaking behind the counter. He's not that kind of dude, I'm assuming, but he doesn't even skate, right? And somehow, Supreme is, you remember there was a thing with Supreme, people were like, oh, you don't even skate though with Supreme. Like, but the founder doesn't even skate. Like he said it quite gorky. He just got it in it for the clothes. He liked the way his cl skate clothing looked. That's why he got involved in Supreme. That's why he, he started to make Supreme. And he and then but then you have some people say, "Oh, but you can't do that." But yes, you can. He did it. He's proof. An Englishman moved to America and made one of the most impactful North American street, um, skateboard slash streetwear brands in the world, and then took it global. He did it. And I think this book is evidence that you can live if not live without money you can't stop making money your lord you can't stop making money your um deciding what you do in life i've never been that kind of guy it, it does shape some of my decisions especially when it comes to work i think money should shape your decision but it's not that you all will be on end all for instance if you're working a job that requires time coming at 8 30 and work till 6 30 but they're paying you 40 grand a year i don't think it's worth it because there will come a point in time when your time is going to be worth more than what they pay you because what they pay you you won't be able to spend because you, your time's all spent at work so there is a middle ground where you can get from meaningful work that really impacts you, that helps you in your life, and also working a job that pays you well. But you can't be on both. You can't be on either ends of the scale, of the scale and just stand there and say, no, I'm only going to work here because they treat me nice and I get to play on the foosball table. Or no, I'm only going to work here because I get to take home three grand a month. That's not the meaning of life. It has to be more to life than the pursuit of money. That is a pursuit of beauty, a pursuit of health, fitness, um, new nourishment, family, love design creative there has to be something more that's because then that will sustain you i'm not I'm, i don't assume the joe rogan point of view where everyone no one should have a nine to five i think that's a bit utopian and a little bit too uh woo -woo liberal for me but i do think people should be trying to post there should be a movement to pursue more hobbies or to pursue little micro hustles little side hustles that you just do as my book here I've got, right side it talks about it here to pursue little side hustles that you've got right that make you i don't know 300 to 400 a, a month right just extra money that could easily go to your holiday that could go to taking your kids out for dinner go taking your wife out you know what i mean those that kind of thing will sustain that will make life more meaningful as opposed to just turning in clocking in clocking out every day nine to five is not the way to go again my opinion only this is only your opinion of a young man from stratford what do i know i know very little anyway that's an hour the excellent thing show episode number 218 thanks for tuning in for more information regarding myself and what i get up to click the link below excellentzinger.com there'll be all my details on there regarding my dj gigs my dj dates places here places to hear my mixes contact details of, of mine email and all that malarkey you can contact me on instagram facebook not facebook i'm not on there that much instagram and twitter connect me on there and yeah um tapis is back on i think it's going to be every month now the end of the month which is good not every friday which might be a bit a bit of a different change of things we're doing every friday for a while now i'll be able to be more, be more fresh be able to play music and stuff blah blah, blah. so i'll see you tomorrow at tapis on friday and i'm playing again i think next saturday somewhere else but i'll get us details with that very very soon everything you'll be able to find on my website excellentzinger.com forward slash dj gigs as ever if you're watching on, on the youtube please like and subscribe leave a comment if i said anything interesting that you want to comment on you want to score me on something that i was not very aware of let me know in the comments and if you're listening via the podcast app, a five-star review will go a long way to help spread this show. Anyway, thanks so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Peace and take care.